Today, January 19, 2004, we are speaking with Ken Weisel of Schenectady, New York. He served in the U.S. Army Air Force from August 1942 through July 1945. This interview is taking place in the Weisel home at 1.45 in the afternoon. The interviewers are Kenneth and June Hunter. Will you please tell us your full name and when and where you were born? Well, the full name is Kenneth Weisel. I was born in Trentford, Germany. But I lived in, raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That is where I enlisted into the Air Force on August uh, 42. Mm -hmm. At the time I was working for the General Electric Company uh, in their construction engineering. We were doing renovating and upgrading a lot of the uh, old steel mills because uh, at that time uh, steel was the main important thing for industry. Uh, I enlisted in the Air Corps because I was very interested in flying. I had built uh, during my younger days many, many models of uh, various types of airplanes and so my interest was in the Air Force. Uh, I entered the Air Force and then was, uh, went to uh, basic training at Keesler Field. And uh, from there I went up to Sioux Falls, South Dakota for radio school. From radio school I went to Las Vegas, Nevada for gunnery school. And from gunnery school we went to Drew Field in Tampa, Florida for crew training uh, on B-17s with the entire crew. That's where they made up the uh, groups that were later to become the flying crews. What was your basic training like? Uh, being in the uh, Air Corps part of the Army, well, the, did you have a different than an infantry uh, soldier? Oh, yes. Uh, the, uh, we didn't have the uh, uh, basic training of uh, running with a pack of couple miles and so forth. It was strictly uh, exercise uh, uh, and uh, marching type uh, uh, things in the morning and in the afternoon and during the uh, schools all day we had uh, uh, in radio school we were in radio most of the day uh, and in uh, gunnery school we had uh, training in gunnery. Uh, that was a very uh, radio school. Was just, let's say, uh, teaching us the inward works of a radio, so that we could repair. If a radio broke down, we could repair it. We were, uh, and this is strictly the type of uh, uh, radios and transmitters that were used in the planes at the time. This is what we were trained in. Also in uh, receiving and sending messages by code, the Morse code. Uh, you had to graduate, you had to be able to take 16 words a minute. Uh, actually, once you got into the air and got used to uh, flying, uh, 10 words a minute was the maximum that you needed, but the school insisted on 16. Uh, uh, then from there we went, uh, once you uh, got through the radio school, then you were sent to uh, gunnery school because uh, if you were going to do flying, you had to be a part of the gunnery uh, on the plane. There's, each uh, enlisted man had a position in, in uh, the uh, plane to uh, man a gun, except for the radio. The uh, gunnery school was uh, quite an extensive uh, training because there you learn how to take apart and repair a 50 caliber machine gun. 
uh, not only uh, by uh, taking it apart and looking at the parts, but you had to know it so well that you had to be able to do it blindfold. Take the gun apart, feel the part and tell which part was worn or broken, and then replace that part while blindfolded and put it back together again and have it working. This was uh, a very uh, uh, important part of the training because uh, in a lot of positions, for example in the uh, tail position, you can't see the uh, gun that you're working on if it malfunctions. You have to do it all by feel. Uh, in the uh, chin turret, uh, you can reach down and uh, you can't see the gun, but uh, again, you have to just feel. So that was why we were trained in that manner. We also were trained in uh, how to use uh, sidearms. Uh, we got a very short and uh, quick uh, training on uh, the Thompson machine gun and the M1 carbine rifle. But the uh, main part was the uh, 45 caliber pistol because that's what all crew members wore. Uh, we all had uh, 45 caliber pistols as part of our armament when we were flying. Uh, a little interesting point that I might add to here, because the uh, 45 was the uh, weapon that uh, we mainly handled, we had to fire that for a record. So we went out on the firing range. I was given a 45 and told by the instructor to fire the first clip for practice. The second clip, which we laid on the table there in front, says that'll be uh, the record, the clip that you use for firing for a record. Well, I took the first clip, raised the gun, lowered it, and pointed it into the direction of the target pulled the trigger and there was just a loud explosion and all I had left in my hand was the handle of the 45. The whole gun just exploded. Well, <laughs> fortunately, none of the parts flew towards me or anybody nearby. But uh, the instructor came running over and asked right away, you hurt, you know. You know, I'm fine. So he hands me a another gun, and I put the clip in it, brought it down, aimed it towards the target, pulled the trigger, and all I got was a soft click. No fire. Another malfunction. So I raised the gun again, very carefully this time, and called the instructor, and he come running over, what's the matter? He says, thing didn't fire, it misfired. Just so he took the gun, handed me a, another gun. Now this time I was shaking so bad, <laughs> I don't know how I ever hit the target, but I must have, I, I claim to this day that I must have shook in the right direction because <laughs> I got marksman out of it. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, I still have the uh, marksman medal for it. But, uh, the other uh, instance after uh, we, uh, we flew uh, and fired at, uh, uh, off of a uh, B-17, we fired uh, at a sleeve towed by a B-26 bomber and uh, they checked our firing ability by counting the number of colored holes that were in them because the bullets were colored and the color came off when it hit the fabric of the sleeve. So the uh, after uh, gunnery school, which uh, I might add was, uh, we were real lucky to be there because uh, that was Las Vegas and uh, we could get into town on a weekend. So we enjoyed that very much. But it uh, naturally it wasn't the town that it is today. But uh, after that, after the uh, gunnery school, we went to, uh, I went home on a uh, uh, seven-day 
leave. And then I had to go to uh, Groovefield, which was in Tampa, Florida. And this is where we uh, made up a crew. And uh, when we made up a crew, we already had another radio man. So being my size, I decided that rather uh, the other radio man was a seven-footer. Uh, he wouldn't have fitted into the ball turret. So the ball turret man usually is also a radio man. So I was assigned to the ball turret. Uh, the, uh, we flew B-17s, and uh, this was actually, uh, we would fly from, uh, on uh, training bases anywhere from Tampa there, Drew Field, uh, down to uh, as uh, far down as Havana, we would circle, circle Havana and come back up. And these long hauls were for basically uh, for the navigator's training. He had to set up the uh, course that uh, we took. Uh, the one thing that happened while we were there, uh, when I was in school, I was with a uh, another student and he and I both, when we graduated, ended up working for the General Electric Company's construction engineering in Pittsburgh. Uh, I did not know that he was at uh, Drew Field at the time until one day we were called into the office or to the briefing room and we were told that a B-17 had been missing in the Gulf. They told us who the crew was that were on that 17. Well, when they mentioned the navigator's name, I let out a remark, and our pilot asked, what's the matter, Ken? And I said, that navigator is my buddy from school and work. So when we, uh, each plane was given a zone to cover in the Gulf where this plane that went, was missing should have been. And uh, because uh, I had said that uh, he was, uh, one of those crew was a friend of mine, our pilot brought our plane down very low and I went into the ball turret with the binoculars to see if we could spot anything. After a while I called up to the pilot and says, uh, you know, I don't have a bathing suit on and I don't like being wet with clothes on. Would you mind raising a little <laughs> bit? That ball turret was almost lapping up the waves. He, was, and he says, but Ken, he says, we wanted to make sure we were down low enough to spot anything. I said, well, a couple of feet higher won't hurt. <laughs> so he moved up. But uh, we never, never found anything, so I assume that uh, my buddy is down there somewhere in a B-17 in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. Now you have a model of a B-17 alongside you. If you raise it up there, we'll try to focus in on it. And I know that at the bottom of it, there is nothing to show where the ball turret was ball on turret. there. So um, let me focus in a little bit on it. All right, now. It would be right about in here, just behind where the wings are on the underside of the 17. What were the other gun positions on this aircraft? Uh, there were uh, the uh, top turret, which was up here. There was the chin turret, which was in the front here. There were the two waist guns, one on each side, and then the tail guns were two in the back. How many engines did this aircraft have? Four. They were uh, right uh, cyclones. And uh, I forget what, uh, 1,200 horsepower, I think, if I remember right. But uh, after the uh, crew training, oh, I might uh, inject here, uh, because we uh, flew at high altitude, we were taken in uh, to a pressure chamber, and they asked uh, for one of the, uh, for three men to volunteer to leave our masks off while the uh, 
pressure was brought up to 30,000 feet. <coughs> they wanted to show what uh, can happen to a person if he doesn't have oxygen at high altitude. Uh, like being a sucker, I volunteered. <laughs> and uh, they gave me a clipboard and paper on it, told me to write my name, rank, and serial number. Well, I started writing, and uh, they took the thing up. And the next thing I knew, I'm laying on the table, or on the uh, seat, uh, seating there, with a mask on my face, and the instructor sitting over me, saying, telling me that you'll be all right, you'll be all right, because I was, I guess, motioning my hands around, just doing something. I don't know, but anyway. When I came to finally get the senses back, I realized they had told me that I had passed out. And uh, they asked me, how did you feel? I said, I never felt anything different. I just, all, everything was normal. He says, how about your writing? Oh, yeah, I wrote perfect all the time. So, yeah, they showed me the clipboard. Well, the first three or four lines were fine. But after that, they were all over the <laughs> paper. <laughs> And uh, they sh in showed the, the rest of the uh, group that was in that class that uh, this is what can happen. You never know when you're out of oxygen until it's too late, and then you're dead. So always make sure that you're getting oxygen. And uh, this was a, a point that they were very emphatic about doing. And they told the uh, all the crews, because all of us, from this crew were in that chamber, plus other, there were several crews in that chamber. But they pointed out that uh, when flying at high altitude to always call around to each position and make sure that that position answers. If, they, if it don't answer, have somebody pick a walk around bottle and go back and find out why, because that can make the difference of that man staying, being alive or being dead. And tell us the position you had to be in to be in that turret area. Well, <laughs> that was the one position that the, uh, you know, everybody likes to lay down on a job. Well, that had, that's what you had to do. You actually, in the ball turret, you were actually in a laying position. You actually laid down. And uh, it was very comfortable. As a matter of fact, I fell asleep once. And... Uh, the uh, pilot, uh, the whole crew heard me snoring. <laughs> Somebody called and just wake that guy up. <laughs> but uh, one of the uh, uh, instances that happened, uh, we had uh, went from uh, after crew training, we were sent over to uh, Savannah, Georgia to Hunter Field to pick up a brand new B-17 and fly it over to England. Uh, but before we took it over, we had to put four hours on it to check it out and make sure everything was in perfectly working order. Well, we took it up and after about an hour in the air, we found that the uh, pilot's uh, radio, his command radio, was blowing a fuse. So we decided to land and have that replaced and have it uh, uh, corrected because uh, there was something was uh, short in that radio and it was causing that fuse to blow. Well, I had the uh, flight engineer bring me up a bunch of fuses from the front, spare ones that he had up there. <coughs> And uh, I'm standing there at the uh, right side of the uh, radio room, and as soon as the pilot uh, started speaking, and I'd watch the fuse, because it was an open-type fuse where I could see it, and as soon as I see it broke, break, I would pull it and put a new one in so that he could continue talking to the tower. Well, as we landed, we'd 
plane jarred a bit, and I was standing there and didn't get knocked over on mop my feet or anything, just kind of jiggled around a bit. And I turned to our engineer and I says, boy, I says, the pilot uh, made a rough landing that time. I said, that's not like him. We'll have to talk to him about it, jokingly. With that, the flight engineer gets up, goes to the uh, door at the radio room because the plane had stopped and we figured we'd get out. Well, when he opened the door to the radio room, which was back to the waist of the ship, there was the ball turret sticking up inside the plane. And he says, Ken, we crashed. That's why we shook. So both of us made a mad dash out of that plane because we didn't want to catch fire. But uh, they claimed uh, that the co-pilot had raised, had fla flapped the, uh, yeah, had uh, pushed the one switch for the flaps instead of the landing, and he, instead he had hit the landing gear switch. But he said no, and the pilot said no, that never happened. Because uh, there's a, a uh, mechanism that he has to lift up before he can hit the uh, landing gear switch. And he did not lift that up. So they were arguing about it in headquarters at the time when another plane was taking off and his landing gears collapsed. So they started checking a little closer and they found out that there was sabotage on the plane. Mm -hmm. Our landing gears had been tampered with. And the same thing with that plane that had been just taking off. So sabotage happens anytime, anywhere. Uh, you get uh, kind of uh, when you hear sabotage, uh, at least myself, I I feel that uh, there's something about it that uh, you never know who's going to do it. It can be your next door neighbor. But those are things that happen. Now, in the uh, in the uh, Air um, Army Air Corps, what the particular section was it assigned to? Was it a heavy bomber unit? To what particular Air Force uh, uh, number did it have? Uh, the Air Force, uh, the Air, Army Air Corps was divided up into Air Forces. Uh, for example, the 8th Air Force was uh, made up of all heavy bombers, uh, B-17s and B-24s, uh, plus uh, some fighter escorts. The uh, Ninth Air Force was made up of medium bombers uh, along with some fighter escorts. <coughs> the entire Air, Army Air Corps was divided up into air forces such as that. Uh, for example, the 15th Air Force was uh, uh, originally stationed in, in Africa and then later in Italy. The 20th Air Force was over in the Pacific. Uh, the third was along the east coast of the U.S. Uh, I can't think of, uh, there was one up in Alaska, I think it was the 11th that uh, guarded the Alaskan coast. But uh, all of the uh, different uh, groups were, were uh, numbered in, in that manner. Uh, some of them had both fighters and, or most of them had both fighters and bombers. But uh, I know the 8th Air Force was made up strictly, as I said, of uh, uh, B-17s uh, and B-24s plus uh, fighter escorts. And they flew strictly out of uh, England. There were no, no other area that the 8th Air Force uh, was in. The 8th Air Force also uh, is called the Mighty 8th Air Force, and the reason it's called the Mighty 8th is it is the only Air Force or Air Corps group that could put up 
2,000 planes in one day, plus at least another 1,000 fighters to escort those 2,000 bombers. There's no other group that could do that. Uh, even today, there's no, no group that can put that many planes in the air at one time. How did you get uh, from the United States, so where did you depart from to go overseas into the well, war zone? When we picked up the plane at uh, Savannah, uh, that was a brand new plane that we were to, uh, to ferry over to England. We flew from Savannah then up to uh, Fort Dix uh, where we refueled. From Fort Dix we went to Bangor, refueled at Bangor then flew through, uh, up to uh, Goose Bay, Gander, Newfoundland. From Gander, Newfoundland, we uh, flew across to uh, Prestwick, Scotland, where we dropped the plane off at a sub-depot there that made it, prepared that plane then for combat. Uh, it might be of interest to point out here that the plane that we took over was uh, later assigned to another uh, group. I think it was the 301 bomb group that that plane was assigned to. But it uh, was shot down about three weeks after it was in combat. Uh, there is a record of all the planes that were in combat, which I have uh, here. It's a book that was put out by the Air Force and tells you what happened to each plane that was in combat. Uh, I myself did uh, 33 missions and uh, I've received the uh, Air Medal with three clusters, uh, the Distinguished Flying Cross. After uh, I finished uh, my f combat flight, Combat flying only took about three months. From, well, I flew from uh, May, uh, end of May until uh, the middle of August. And then I was finished with uh, combat flying. Then I was asked, and the rest of the crew was sent back to the States. I was asked to stay on as acting squadron gunnery officer and also instructor in the school that they were starting up. Because they found that uh, the reason they were starting up the school, they found that these new gunners coming across from the States were trained as far as uh, flying and how to handle the guns, the, the 50 caliber. But when it come to uh, teaching them what to expect from the enemy fighters and how to handle that situation, uh, they wanted uh, those that had some combat experience to give them that information, plus then also brief them uh, and give them a rebriefing on uh, the rest of the stuff, such as the 50 caliber, the various gun positions, and just uh, kind of a refresher type course. We, uh, we set this school up and uh, this is what we, we did there. In the meantime, as uh, acting gunnery officer, my job was to make sure that uh, when uh, the crews come back, they took the uh, inside or guts, as we called it, out of the 50 calibers and took it down to a gun shack. There they cleaned them with guns and made sure that they were ready for the next morning. Well, my job was to make sure that the crews did clean those guns because a lot of times Another crew might fly that plane, and if those guns were not clean, when they picked them up in the morning, they didn't have time to clean those guns. And if they were heavily fired, there would be enough uh, residue in there that it could create a malfunction or even uh, an explosion of the, the gun. Uh, for example, when we uh, got into the uh, England, the, one of the things that they 
sent us to was a little airfield uh, just outside of London called Bobbington uh, in the holding cell. And then we were sent up to a place called a wash where we were given another little extensive training on the gun positions. Well, when I climbed into the 50 caliber, I mean, uh, into the uh, ball turret there and fired those 50 calibers in there, they had been fired quite extensively and uh, they weren't clean. When I went to fire, it exploded and it knocked me out completely. Uh, when they pulled that gun out, the whole casing was fortunately, it didn't burst, the casing just expanded and uh, no parts were flying around inside the turret because if they had been, I wouldn't be here today. But uh, it did knock me out, and uh, I remember coming to, laying on the ground outside of the turret. But this is what could happen to a gun, and we didn't want uh, that to happen in combat. So I used to check, make sure that all the crews, when they came back, cleaned those guns. Because like I said, another crew might be taking that gun and they didn't know whether that gun was clean or not because the same guns were always used in the same plane there was no different set of guns put in a different plane a certain set of guns were always for a certain plane what was the typical mission like from the start when you were given the information what was going to be expected of you until you came back well uh, all the missions, as far as uh, combat was concerned, were pretty much one like the, the next. Unless you were going to a very, uh, uh, if you were going to a uh, uh, place like uh, Schweinfurt or uh, Pinamundi, uh, where there was a lot of uh, uh, heavy uh, German uh, work being done, like uh, Pinamundi was strictly a uh, place where they were doing working on uh, atomic energy. A lot of people don't realize, but Germany was working heavily trying to get that set up. Uh, one time, the, the first time that we flew there, we went uh, there twice. The first time, uh, we were supposed to be at 28,000 feet. And uh, I called the navigator, and I says to him, uh, what's our altitude? And he says, 28,000. We're right on the nose. I says, it can't be. He says, why not? I says, look at the size of those buildings. We're only about 15 or so thousand feet. He says, no, Ken. He says, those buildings are just that big. They were huge. And actually, at 28,000, it looked like we were about 10, 15,000 feet from the size of those buildings. They were enormous. What was in them, uh, I never found out. But the second time, whatever we hit, I don't, again, we don't know what was in those buildings, but we do know that uh, Germany was working on atomic energy. And but we hit something that uh, the cloud of smoke and vapors came up. And again, we were around 28,000. And the vapors came up, the smoke came up above us, went up to about 30, 35,000 feet. Whatever it was, it was really, we really hit something heavy, so we thought. Uh, The uh, worst uh, things that we ran into in combat was the flak. That scared us more than anything. Fighters, you could shoot back, you could fire back at them. You could maneuver around. You had something to do, you could take action. And it took your mind off of what your, uh, what your thoughts were because you were concentrating on getting those fighters and shooting at them trying to knock them out. But with flak, all you could do was 
just pray that it didn't hit you. Uh, as a, an example, one time we were flying over a target, and I looked down. One of the jobs of the uh, ball turret was to look down and s try to see where the first three or four bombs hit. Because the first three or four bombs, would you could see a flash of, from them. And after that, the uh, smoke was so heavy you couldn't see anymore. What, uh, but from those first three or four flashes, when we got back to the headquarters, a debriefing, they would show us a map, or actually a picture, photo, an aerial photo of the area that we were bombing, and say, where were those flashes? And that's how they could tell whether we were directly on target or slightly off. <coughs> and in this particular time, I was looking down, and I saw this flash of flak couple thousand feet below, but dead center, directly below us. A few seconds later, there was another one. This time it was a little higher, but still below us. There was a third one. Well, and I called the pilot, and I said, you know, there have been three flashes down there, three flaks, dead center. I said, the next one's going to goose us. And he says, I'm sorry, Ken, but he says, I can't do anything. We run the bomb run. The bomb run is controlled by the bombardier with the bomb site. And just as he was saying that, the bombardier said, bombs away. And the pilot swung the plane over to, to a left hand and a slight dive, which put my turret up high where I could see where we would have been. There was a nice black flak flash up there, but we missed it. It missed us, and thank goodness it didn't. Uh, we didn't have to fly that extra second straight ahead. But that was a one of the bad features of flying, and what scared most of the fellows. Uh, on the bomb run, you had to fly a true straight course for about. Anywhere from three, a short uh, run was about three minutes to five, six minutes. And uh, the enemy knew exactly where your target was, so they would put up a barrage of flak that you had to go through. You had no choice but to fly through it. And there was nothing you could do. Just pray that you didn't get hit. And. Uh, that was what scared most of them. Besides the uh, flak from the ground, you also had the threat of German fighter planes coming at you. Uh, right. How did the turrets work? Uh, did you have to manually control oh, them? No. Or? The, uh, both the top turret and the ball turret were hydraulically controlled, uh, electrically and hydraulically. And we also had computing sites, which uh, if you got the uh, fighter uh, into your uh, radicals of your uh, site and you tracked him uh, correctly, you got a fighter. He, he, was, uh, he was knocked out of there. Uh, you didn't get much chance. I mean, you're, every, that all had to happen in a few seconds because uh, everything uh, was moving so fast. The fighters were going at three, four hundred miles per hour. So you didn't, uh, there wasn't uh, a lot of time, but uh, if you uh, were good and you knew what you were doing, uh, you could track with the turret, uh, the uh, ball turret and the top turret, they tracked very fast. They could, could operate uh, real good. And uh, they could rotate down 90 degrees and uh, go 360 degrees in rotation. So you uh, you had uh, good use of the uh, a good use of the turrets. Uh, the handheld guns in the waist and the tail were a little different. Those were strictly by sight, uh, eye sight. There was no no uh, no computers on those. Uh, what happened to uh, 
the shell casings were they ejected out of the aircraft in the turret uh, yeah they were ejected right outside of the turret how did you uh, arm your weapon was ammunition close to you that was all done inside it's all inside the turret there's 500 rounds per gun in the turret and that's inside the turret there's a little door that uh, opens up uh, when you're in uh, in park position that you can open up and put it put your guns in put your ammunition in uh, if it came that we ever ran out of ammunition then the either one of the waste gunners or the radio man we had boxes of ammunition in the waste they would reload the turret for me but uh, you never fired in long bursts you always fired a short very short burst uh, four or five rounds and that was per, per uh, burst so I Myself, I never ran out of ammunition, so I didn't have to worry about that. But uh, uh, we did, uh, a lot of uh, people wonder about tracers because uh, you heard so much about the, the tracer bullets. Well, we threw them out. We didn't use them uh, because they were useless, because they gave you the wrong trajectory, because they were a light shell. They swung off in the wrong direction, where the heavier bullets, the, the lead bullets, the steel bullet, which we had, and the armor-piercing bullet and the explosive bullet all were heavier, and they took a different trajectory. So we didn't bother with the uh, tracer because uh, that misled you, and uh, we just uh, eliminated them out of the uh, belt. I don't know about what some of the others did, but that's what I did, because I knew that they were useless, so I use them. Uh, On the return from a mission, uh, were you allowed the opportunity for relaxation to go in and uh, into the local uh, communities, meet with people? Oh yeah, during the, in, once you got back. Uh, if you were back or which you would normally you were back pretty early you could go to town and, and uh, like uh, uh, little town of Brigstock was only five miles from uh, where we were based uh, there was no pub in Grafton Underwood which was where the uh, air base was that I was at Grafton Underwood was a town of about uh, well maybe a dozen houses and that was it a post office a church and uh, some farmhouses but uh, Brigstock was a little bigger town. It had about uh, oh, maybe two, three dozen houses. And there was a couple of pubs in there, with several churches. Uh, and that's where we uh, used to go and uh, we'd have uh, our beer right there at night. We did have on the base, we had a, uh, what they call a sergeant's club where, that you could go to, but uh, it was more fun going out into the town because uh, five miles on a bicycle wasn't that far to pedal. And that's what we used to do. Most of us all had our own bicycles. We either got them from the crew that uh, had passed away or uh, finished their missions and uh, or we'd buy them in town at, uh, from uh, someplace uh, black market if necessary. But there was a lot of ways. Uh, most of us had bikes over there. Did you have any opportunity to meet with uh, members of the British uh, Armed Forces? Oh, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the town of Brigstock uh, was where uh, a group of uh, ATS, uh, which is the uh, uh, Auxiliary Territorial Service, uh, which was the women's uh, branch of the uh, British Army, uh, were stationed there. On uh, They were there for replacement to other areas and uh, we used to see them there and uh, as a matter of fact that's where I met both my present wife and my first wife both at the same time we met there and uh, were there occasions uh, when you came under enemy uh, attack in England uh, not our base 
There was was an instance uh, where a base about five miles away from us, uh, a group of German paratroopers landed, and uh, they almost destroyed the uh, base as far as the planes were concerned. Although they were all killed, there wasn't one of the uh, paratroopers that uh, was left alive. Uh, that was after that. Up until then, we never carried our guns on us. They were in a locker. The only time we put them on was when we were flying. But after that, the order was that uh, you carried your sidearm with you all the time. Uh, they put guards on all the planes, which we never had at the time up until then. Uh, there were two guards stationed at each plane, one with a uh, Thompson machine gun, the other with a carbine. And uh, all of us, uh, that when we were going around the base, we had to wear our, our side arms, or if they were uh, cooks or uh, orderlies, they were issued carbines, they had to carry them around. But uh, nothing ever happened. Our base was, uh, and, and as far as I know, that only happened at one time, and uh, it never happened again or before or after that. On return from missions uh, you know, over Europe, were there occasions when you were pursued by German aircraft fighter pilots? Uh, yes, there were at the beginning. Uh, uh, especially uh, well, uh, before D-Day, they would uh, come after us uh, when we got along the uh, coast. But once we got across, uh, over towards the channel, then the Spitfires and the uh, P-47s, uh, which were there early, uh, they would come up and uh, they would drive them off and we didn't have too much worry about them. Uh, Speaking of the fighter escorts, the ones that we loved the most was uh, the P-38s, which uh, were used at the early part because the P-38 could actually go with us all the way. But there were so few of them, and there were so many bomber groups, they couldn't cover all the bomber groups. They could only cover one or two small groups. So the uh, P-38 was... Uh, not a very uh, good escort as far as the entire Air Force was concerned, the 8th Air Force, but as far as one group was concerned, they were great because uh, the couple of times that we had P-38s giving us escort, uh, we <laughs> wished that they could be there all the time because uh, when we were coming near a German airfield, for example, where they had uh, any aircraft guns, a couple of the P-38s would drop down, instead of staying above us for protection, they would drop down and strafe the gun areas, and we'd get no flak from that area. So we could pass over safely, but uh, which uh, the P-51s and the P-47s were not uh, good at that kind of uh, ground. Later after uh, they got a number of P-51s in, and could give us escort and uh, give the, the majority of the uh, bombers escort. Uh, the P-38s were assigned strictly to ground uh, support because they were good at, at uh, low-level type work. But uh, the P-51s were great uh, once they got into a good number there. They, they really gave uh, excellent escort. And, uh, when you were back on the ground and at times for recreational relief, were there occasions where you attended USO functions uh, or the, with USO or the British uh, U equivalent of the USO? Well, a lot of times uh, there'd be, uh, uh, would be because of uh, having flown so often, We'd be stood down for two or three days. Well, you could get a pass and, and go into London. There was uh, the USO show there at London, but uh, we never had any at our base. Uh, there were at a few of the bases, I understand, of uh, times when the USO uh, came to the air base, but uh, never to ours. Uh, 
uh, we would have a good relaxation because, uh, like I said, the, a lot of times due to weather, uh, the English weather uh, didn't permit you to fly day after day. It, it uh, <coughs> got pretty rustic and uh, there'd be three, four days when you couldn't fly at all. Uh, just to give you an example, we had one time, uh, this was after I finished flying, I was doing some work to uh, set up this school that uh, we had. And uh, a friend of mine, Ray, and he and I were in a Jeep. We went over to the far side of the field to pick up some stuff out of one of the hangars over there. We were coming back. We heard this engines roaring. And uh, Ray says, uh, gee, I hope nobody's taxiing. I says, Ray, I says, we can hardly see the front end of the Jeep. How can he taxi an airplane? Well, the next thing I knew, here's these four propellers coming at us. We could just barely see them. They were just a few feet in front of us. Ray threw that Jeep into reverse faster than you could shake a stick. We started backing up, and those propellers still kept coming with us. We turned off and went down to the runway. The runway was asphalt. The area that we were on was the uh, around the airstrip. That was concrete. So when we hit the asphalt, Ray turned down and went down the uh, runway, knowing the plane couldn't take off. So we thought, the plane followed us right down. Well, he went off into the raid. Then decided, the heck with that. Is the plane going to follow us? He drove the jeep off into the grass off the runway, which got us away from the plane. We could hear that plane. It took off. We could tell from the sound. Ray says, I can't understand how it can take off. Well, how can he see? So finally, we were trying to find our way off the base, off this the thing, because the fog was so heavy that, as I said, we could barely see the front end of the jeep. That's not very far, about two or three feet. Finally, a voice hollered, hey, you out there with the jeep? What are you doing out there? Trying to find our way back. He says, well, keep coming towards my voice. So that's what we did. And it was near the control tower. Oh, well, we got out. I got out at, uh, once we got by the control tower. I got out and I went up to the stairs. I was going to talk to the guys up in the control tower about letting his plane fly. But when I got halfway up there, I was in the clear. It's a ground fog. It was only about 10, 15 feet from the ground up. And after that, it was beautifully clear, sunny day. And the pilot in that plane was up that high that he could see. <laughs> he knew exactly where he was. <laughs> he had a perfect clear day to fly. <laughs> but uh, that was the kind of weather. A lot of times, those kind of weather stopped the uh, flying. And uh, if there were two or three days and they knew it, you could get a pass and go to town or uh, do whatever you liked. Now you have some interesting mementos here from your service. If you would hold them, I'll focus in on them, and if you can explain those things to us there. Okay, on the top we see four circular... Yeah, the first is the Air Cadets, which uh, is what I got into, and I was washed out of there there I went into the regular Air Force. From the Air Force we went over to the 3rd Air Force, which was along the East Coast. That's when we were in uh, crew training. Then from there I went overseas and was assigned to the 8th Air Force. And that's where I was until I was discharged out of the Air Force. Now, oh, there are a series of uh, wing emblems out there. These are the, this is the gunner wings, and this one over here is the crew member wings. All gunners uh, were also crew members, and uh, you were uh, allotted both wings. Uh, the gunners is a special, it's got a little a 50 caliber bullet there with wings, where the uh, crew member wings are just a round with the eagle in it. Uh, this is the radio emblem that uh, when you graduate from radio school, you were assigned as a radio operator. You were allowed to wear that on your left sleeve. Or I also went to the armor school later, 
and was uh, allowed to do that. And the fellow in the middle, that handsome devil. That's, that's me taken last week. <laughs> then on the bottom, uh, the two medals on the extreme left. Is it uh, on, on this side? Yes. The one is the victory medal. The other is the uh, Normandy medal. Anybody that was on flying or on the ground at D-Day, the people of Normandy uh, gave them that medal. And uh, that's your chevrons there. Yes, what rank was that? Staff sergeant. Then uh, the other two yeah. medals there. The uh, medal here is the uh, air medal with uh, three clusters, which repeats the uh, the cluster is a repeat of the medal and then the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross. Up here we have the bar that we wore, which uh, has the colors of the various, uh, this is the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal, and this is a combat ribbon with four uh, stars in it, one for each major battle. Okay, well, thanks for showing us those. Now, uh, we have a short time. Do you belong to any veterans' organizations? Yes, I, I as a matter of fact, I'm commander of the uh, President VFW Post 9132. I also uh, am treasurer for uh, the 8th Air Force chapter, local chapter here. And I belong to the American Legion uh, Post. What was the feeling like when it was announced the war in Europe was over? How did everybody react? Relieved. <laughs> because uh, a lot of, uh, of course, uh, we all celebrated it, uh, but uh, uh, relief was really the big thing that we knew. Uh, there was uh, no, no danger of getting shot down again or anything like that. How long did you have to wait before you could come back to the United States and go through the discharge process and then go back well, into civilian life? I was one of the lucky ones. Uh, right after the uh, war ended, uh, I was asked to uh, make up a crew uh, and go to Presswick, uh, Scotland, uh, Wales, rather, and pick up a another brand new plane that had just been flown over for replacement but not needed to take it back to the States. So that's what we did. We uh, made up a crew of fellows like myself who were not needed over there anymore after the war was over. <clears throat> so then we flew a brand new plane back to the States and uh, figuring they were going to use those planes uh, in the Pacific later on. But uh, I got back, uh, well, we flew from uh, Breswick, Scotland, uh, Wales, to uh, the Azores. Uh, we landed at Santa Maria Island. Uh, we spent uh, three or four days there. And then from there we went back, flew back to uh, Gander, Newfoundland, and from Gander down to uh, Bradley, Connecticut. Here is where we turned the ship over to the uh, Air Force there. And uh, we went by train then down to uh, Fort Dix. And uh, that's where I was then l later. I was given a 30-day leave. And when I came back after the 30-day leave, I was asked if uh, I would accept a discharge. And that was it. Uh, Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your experiences with us. Thank you.